first down, they hand off to Marlon Mack. Huge hole, 50-yard line. He's at the 40, still going near sideline. He's at the 10, he's at the 5, and he will score. Touchdown, Marlon Mack. Touchdown, I-N-D-Y. And again, it's picked off. It's Darius Leonard. Leonard with a second INT, and he's streaking down the near sideline. He's at the 40, he's at the 30, he's at the 20. He's going to go. A pick six for the Maniac. Horseshoe is back, baby. The horseshoe is back. What is going on, Colts Nation, and welcome back to another episode of the Bring the Juice Colts podcast. Well, the Indianapolis Colts defeat the Houston Texans, kind of a nail-biter, a score of 27 to 20. On with me, my friend Zach Morrow. On with us, uh, part of the podcast. Zach, why don't you explain a little bit to our listeners a little bit about who you are and kind of what you do uh, to help the channel. How's it going, guys? Zach here. Um, I joined the channel. I sent a message asking them if I needed a video out of there. And ever since the other day, I've just been doing a bunch of videos for them, like highlight reels and everything just for the podcast. Yeah, and we've been lucky to have you, man. Appreciate it, and uh, glad to have you on board. But Zach, this game, man, was uh, was a really, mu- really a nail biter. After Indianapolis jumped out to that fourteen nothing lead, Houston came roaring back and eventually tied it at twenty. And then Indianapolis obviously went down, drove again, scored, and then their defense was able to get a late turnover and win this game. But uh, Houston was still driving, and that it was really kind of one of those games, kind of similar to a couple weeks ago. And Houston's driving, and, and they, the turnover really ends that game for them. They had two chances to go down there and in the first game take the lead, the second game tie it up here. What was your overall impressions of this game before we kind of dive into the offense, the defense, and all that stuff in between? This game was way too close for comfort. It can't come down to the end of the game like that because we started off 14-0 and then just disintegrated because the defense slacked off. And it shouldn't be that close in the end. Yeah, I mean, the defense really uh, struggled a little bit, especially in, in passing yards. Sean Watson nearly had 400 yards passing. You know, I guess the good thing, the saving grace for this defense, they only allowed 20 points. But it was a little bit weird to see the second-half defense kind of not making the adjustments we're used to them seeing. It was a little bit weird in that way. Um, so it's just, just kind of an off day for this defense in certain ways. Um, but let's get into this offense a little bit. Talk about this Colts passing offense. Phillip Rivers on the day, 23 of 28, 228 yards, two touchdowns, no picks, got sacked once. And I think, you know, we could kind of argue that sack really wasn't on the offensive line. It was more on Rivers. Like he probably could have thrown that ball away if he really wanted to. What was your overall impression of Phillip Rivers in this game? Well, for him going 22-28, he's starting to be more consistent, no interceptions, and, like, giving it to different receivers. And he's not, like, forcing throws anymore. Right. But, yeah, like you said, he was holding it way too long. That caused one sack. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, overall, I feel like Phillip Rivers has been really performing really well recently, has had – I believe right now on the year, he's somewhere around 3,700 yards, 22 touchdowns as opposed to only nine picks. So Rivers has really been turning it up. There was, it's crazy, Zach, to think about. There was a point in this season where Phillip Rivers had more interceptions than touchdowns earlier on in the year, and fans were actually questioning, should Rivers be benched? Especially after that Cleveland game, a lot of fans, I remember, were asking that question. You know, I wasn't wasn't there yet, but I was like, should the Colts evaluate, you know, Jacob Eason potentially like – it, it, it was just like a really rough game for Rivers. But fortunately, he came back and has been performing really, really well. Uh, I've loved what I've seen from him and, and kind of staying with his passing game. How about Zach Pascal? I know you made a video earlier about Zach Pascal is one of your favorite players on the Colts, and he comes out leading the team with five catches for 79 yards and two touchdowns. He had that last touchdown to really take the lead when it was tied and deadlocked at 2020. Zach Pascal made that catch. Philip Rivers threw it out to him. Pascal did the rest. It's always great to see Zach Pascal. He hasn't done a ton this season in terms of stats wise. Like he hasn't had one of these really huge games like he had like last year, but he's always been consistent. He always makes a couple key catches. And I think the beauty of this passing offense, Zach, is really any of these guys can can beat you. They really can. One week it's Michael Pittman, one week it's T. Y. Hilton, who we'll get to in a second. And then one week it's Zach Pascal, one week it's Marcus Johnson. It just, it just this passing offense can beat you in so many different ways. They spread the ball around so much. Phillip Rivers does. What was your overall impression of Pascal here when his number was called upon? Five catches out of six targets. He was there when his number was called. There's like 
he's there whenever we need like a big play, just like Marcus Johnson. Like you said, he's always there. We need a big play. And we went to him and he basically led us to the victory. Yeah, he, he really did. He, he performed so well. I was so happy for him that he got his number called a little bit more than, than normal. T.Y. Hilton also had a pretty nice day, four catches for 71 yards. And he had that really key catch down there by the goal line um, on that last drive the Colts had on offense. And, you know, Hilton didn't have like the necessarily flashy day like he had a couple weeks ago, but – Overall, another solid day for Hilton. Four catches, 71 yards, like I mentioned. That key catch down the sideline. Man, when when is Houston going to learn that they can't uh, lose T.Y. Hilton? Because every single time they try to cover this man, somehow he always makes them pay for it. it, it it's just to the point right now where T.Y. Hilton literally owns the Texans. Like It's, it's just like inevitable. T.Y. Hilton is going to have a big catch in about every single game he plays against the Houston Texans. <laughs> Uh, man, how huge has it been, do you think, for T.Y. Hilton to really – he's been coming on the last couple of weeks especially. How big is it for this offense to have T.Y. Hilton kind of playing like the, the T.Y. Hilton a couple of years ago? How big has it been for this passing offense? He's really improved this season, and him being as good as he is, they're double-teaming him. So other people on the offense are getting open, like Pittman, the running backs getting out of the backfield. Mm. And Pascal, of course, is getting open, scored two touchdowns today and just – He's feeding the ball to everybody now because of him getting open. Yeah, yeah, he really is. And and then Pittman added two catches as well for 19 yards. So not a spectacular day from him, but he just made the catches when need be. Jack Doyle also had a couple catches. See, the thing is, like, normally the Colts spread the ball around so much where you kind of look at it and you're like, all these guys have, you know, between two and four or five catches. And all these guys are kind of – they spread the ball around so, so well – and what they want to do. Jonathan Taylor also had four receptions on five targets as well, but not really a whole lot of yardage. And speaking of Jonathan Taylor, let's move into this, this Colts rushing offense. Uh, once again, had a really nice day off a 200 plus yard performance against the Raiders between Taylor and Hines. They had up around 120 some yards. So Taylor had 83 yards. Hines had about 43. So whatever the math is on there, about 126, I believe it is between the two of them. So it was a really productive day for both of them. You know, Taylor averaged about 5.2 yards of carry Hines about 8.6. He had 43 yards on five carries. So what was your overall impression of this Colts rushing offense? Because I personally felt like the Colts should continue to run it. Like I felt like the first half they would go away from it and then they'd stall a little bit. And I was like, why are you going away from the stuff that works? I felt like Jonathan Taylor and Naheem Hines are really having another solid day, but what were your impressions of it? Yeah. Jonathan Taylor needs to get fed more because when he gets fed more and just like last week, he got 150 yards, I'm pretty sure. And two touchdowns, and he's yeah. just going off. So he defeat the running backs more. Hines is more agile too. So see how keep feeding both of them. We'll get more running game going on. Actually, Jonathan Taylor is actually getting close to a thousand yards. He is, I yeah. I, I think it's somewhere. <laughs> I think it's somewhere around 160 some yards he needs in the next two games, so about 80 yards per game to reach the thousand yard mark. It's crazy to think about that, especially considering you know midway through the season he was struggling mightily in a lot of ways. He, in fact, mm-hmm. you know, lost some reps there for a couple of weeks, and then he started getting better and started to, you know, obviously running the way he's running now. How crazy is it for you to just potentially see Jonathan Taylor be a thousand yard back after everything that's gone on this season, the highs and the lows? Yeah, at first, like halfway through the season, we thought we were just going to bench him, but now he's like more and more aggressive to like he's earning his spot as a starter. He's just going to keep going, he's just keep like racking up his yards, and he's going to keep being the starter. Yeah, would you say it's more just confidence for Jonathan Taylor at this point? Because I feel like it more so is. Like, he always had that physical traits, but I really feel like he's just more confident in who he is as a back now because, we, you know, we've talked about it on this podcast before. Limited training camp, no preseason. He wasn't supposed to be the starter in, in the whole season, and Marlon Mack obviously went down in week one. So then Taylor, boom, is your starter moving forward. But now I think it's just, you know, experience and also confidence for Jonathan Taylor, and it's been really great to see him continue to, to really have, you know, 80-plus yard games the last couple of weeks and obviously last week 150 was huge for him career high yeah and then Jacoby Brissett we'll have to mention he had that you know he had the one attempt he had the two yard scram or two yard sneak I should say on that uh, fourth down that was really big as well in this game he did have a pass attempt which we'll get into that I'm sure obviously he sneaks it next play to keep him in the game I felt like he could have potentially had a first down or even more ultimately incomplete and then the Colts 
throw two screenplays in a row, which is kind of questionable in my opinion. And then they have to go and kick a field goal. How big do you think that was potentially in the Colts, you know, maybe getting a touchdown as opposed to just three points that they did get? Yeah, they would have been, it wouldn't have been as close that they actually got the touchdown instead of the field goal, but yeah. I'm glad how they bring out like Jacoby for like the short yardages. Right. But also yeah. make them throw every now and then so you get more confident too, just in case Phillip goes down because like his foot's hurt. So you never know what could happen. Yeah, I just didn't like the decision. I felt like Brissett could have – he could have done two other things than what he did. He threw, obviously, incomplete. I felt like he could have thrown it to Jack Doyle, who was right in front of him, or he could have just ran the ball. Like, he really had an opening to do that, but he elected to throw it. I thought that was kind of a big – you know, that could have been – that kind of shifted the momentum. Obviously, that Trey Burton – Philip Rivers barely overthrows Trey Burton on third down, and then the Colts drives kind of stall a little bit there going in, and then Houston obviously makes that comeback. So this offense kind of had a little bit of inconsistency. I felt like there were there when they were on, they were on, but they'd also had some times where it was kind of rough. You know, they would couldn't convert on third down in certain points. So I guess you know, looking at this offense, ultimately a win is a win, and, and we'll we'll get to the defense here in a second. But in your opinion, what does this offense have to do? Because you know, this is Houston. Let's be real; they've won four games all year. Like Deshaun Watson is the only reason they're in that game. When you go and play Pittsburgh next week, when you go and play some of these playoff teams, which you'll presume you'll be in the playoff, wherever that is, what does the Colts offense have to do to stop lagging in certain situations, um, in certain points in the game? Cause they've had those moments and it's just been like very questionable. Like why is the offense super hot? And then all of a sudden super cold, what needs to happen in your opinion for this offense to kind of find a stability in terms of, you know, staying consistent on offense throughout the game. You just got to run the damn ball, like they say. You just got to keep running, be more consistent with it. Because then it opens up play actions. And T.Y. Hill, we know how he does against Houston. You can just open up against other teams, too. Yeah, I, I definitely think running the ball, they should have. They did a decent job at it. But I still felt, I'm always just like, if you're running the ball like as well as you are, why would you go away keep from running, it? Yeah. I just didn't understand that sometimes. And that that is something where Frank and I, Frank Reich and I will probably always disagree. It's just like, why does he always go away from certain things that seem like they work? I mean, he got away with one, I think, a little bit today, but, and I'm not going to blame this on him. Like, there was a lack of execution also, but yeah, there's just certain moments where I'm like, just keep running it. And if you do run it, don't pitch it out to Jonathan Taylor on, you know, first and goal or whatever, lose two yards. Yeah. And, you know, f- fortunately, they, they, they scored then, but still, like, I just kind of felt like, why don't you just run it up the middle? Houston's missing all these different guys. Your offensive line, your interior is probably the best one of the best offensive interiors in, in football. So why don't you just use those? I don't know. There's just certain things, certain play calls. I don't know. I wasn't a huge fan of that play call. And I know Derek will probably disagree with me on that, but I'm just like, man, just run between the tackles. It's been working all day. If you're going to pitch it out, pitch it out to a guy like Hines or something, you know, Taylor's fast, but I feel like Hines is just, he's just so elusive. Like he could make it work. But at that point in the game, I don't know. I just kind of felt like just run the ball. Like you said, just run it and run it smartly. Don't do something stupid. Like you're driving. Don't go away from things that work. And that's just been something I think that I've noticed. And I think that's part of the reason for the inconsistencies as well. But certainly don't want to just you know blame it on a play call because we know that's not the main reason um, or, or it's not like the only reason. You know, there also is a lack of execution, and uh, this offense has got to figure that out. Uh, I did feel like the offensive line, though, did a really good job once again. I mean, this offensive line, we we talked about it before. Like, they had struggled a little bit in terms of running the football, and now the Colts are really starting to turn it on in that department. Obviously, we know how good they are in pass protection. Man, there were multiple times where literally Phillip Rivers had no pressure at all. He just stood there. And for a quarterback like Phillip Rivers, who's essentially a statue, like it just allowed him to go through his progressions. I remember one where like he literally was in the pocket for like 10 seconds, just looking around and found Mo Alley Cox for like a four or five yard game. But like that offensive line was kicking butt in this game. Obviously JJ Watt, we know the type of player he is. He's going to have a moment. He did have a couple of nice tackles in the backfield and stuff like that. But I felt like Braden Smith overall did a really, really solid job on JJ Watt all game long. What was your impression of the offensive line in this game? Yeah, like we were saying earlier, they only gave him one sack and they basically contained JJ Watt for the whole game, which was key because he killed us in the first game against Houston. But yeah, glad we shut him down this game and just basically came out with the win because the offensive line. Yeah. And how crazy would it, is it that that could potentially be JJ Watts last game in a Houston Texans uniform playing against the Indianapolis Colts? Like, 
I've hated JJ Watt for like a decade, but like I gotta respect the guy, man. Like he has been a thorn in our side for so so many years. And uh, man, I don't blame him if he yeah. wants to go to a contender. But uh, you know, certainly from a Colts standpoint, I won't mind if he leaves Houston. I really won't. But I just respect that guy a lot. Like he's just he's such a good player. He's always been a good player. And I just feel like he's such a good person too. And I just got to respect him for that. And he's, yeah, he's a heck of a football player, but yeah, let's shift over now to the Colts defense. So Houston obviously came in pretty lowly ranked in a lot of categories, especially running the football and just total yardage, but they did come in fourth overall in terms of passing the football. We know what type of quarterback Deshaun Watson is like we saw for years with Andrew Luck, no matter what you surround him with, he's going to find ways to make plays and keep you competitive in games. And I felt like that's what he did. That's exactly what he did. Watson had 373 yards and two touchdowns was looking phenomenal in this game. And man, not to mention 11 of those uh, passes were completed to David Johnson, the running back out of the backfield. That was just a struggle all day long mm-hmm. for whatever reason for the Colts to contain him. And then Johnson added eight, eight carries for 27 yards, but yeah, the Colts also sacked Watson five times. So they still got some, some pressure, but I felt like it wasn't like, always super consistent. Like we know the type of quarterback that Watson is, but if he gets outside of the pocket, like we saw that in that third and 15 play, you know, only a handful of quarterbacks can make that play on third and 15. And Watson, just one of those guys protections, breaking down, rolls out to his right, finds a guy open. Like I don't blame the defense at that point. <laughs> and uh, when that happens, because it's like, you're covering for that long. Watson's just incredible. He's going to find a guy open. If you let him do that. But nonetheless, the Colts had five sacks, like I mentioned. DeForest Buckner had three of those. He also had that forced fumble on Watson as well, where basically he just took the the Houston offensive lineman and pushed him into Watson's lap, and Watson lost the ball. Man, I I tell you what, like DeForest Buckner, every single game I watch him, I am more and more happy with that trade every single time. Like 13, I feel like we robbed the 49ers, honestly with how good DeForest Buckner's playing it. Now he has seven and a half sacks on the season. I actually saw a stat, Zach, uh, DeForest Buckner actually with two games to go has set a Colts franchise record with quarterback hits with 24. That's crazy to me. He, he missed the game too. That's just the type yeah. of impact he's having on this defensive line. Man, talk to me about DeForest Buckner for a minute. He's just a uh, force to be reckoned with. When he's in there, there's so many like – Bad down balls. He's hitting the quarterback every single play. You can see it every single time he's getting and hitting the quarterback, no matter who it is, Sean Watson or anybody. He's hitting them. Just like you say, he's getting sacks every game too. And he's a big, like, force when he's there. But when he's injured and out, he's definitely missing. Yeah. Yeah, he definitely is. We saw that a couple weeks ago against Tennessee. We really missed him in that game. You know, he's not just great at getting after the quarterback. He's just a great overall player. He's good at stopping the run. He helps, you know, like every single department. He also was getting double teamed pretty much the entire game. Like he would split double teams and go make those plays. So it's allowing your other defensive linemen to go and make plays as well. And I, and I thought they did a pretty decent job at that. I mean, let's look at it real fast here. So I know Danico Autry had a, had a sack and a half. He played really, really well in this game. He always seems like he plays well against Houston for whatever reason. Autry's always, always a solid guy. And then Tyquan Lewis added the other sack. So that's five, the five sacks in total. Uh, what was your impression of the pass rush? So say outside of Buckner, because we already just talked about him. What was your impression of the pass rush outside of DeForest Buckner in this game? Well, actually, it's a player that nobody really, like, is speaking about. But actually, Teray is starting to, like, get more and more snaps and starting to, like, produce more. And actually, they robbed him of, but he actually had a half sack in the game. The Autry sack yeah. gives you a half the sack, so. Right. I remember that. And I was confused why they didn't give him that, you know, (laughs) that was weird. But yeah, I thought Ture had some nice snaps. He got a little bit more snaps. I saw him in there a little bit more. Still, still some rust to knock off, but I felt like Ture overall had a pretty solid game. Good to see him get some confidence back. Honestly, he was in on a couple sacks there. They didn't credit him with him, but he was there. He was right there. And uh, I love what I see from him um, coming off of that bad injury. I'm honestly good with him just getting some snaps at this point. So For me, it's just like if he's getting consistent pressure, that's just a bonus for me right now. So that's great to see. But, yeah, this this defense struggled a little bit to stop Deshaun Watson. Why do you think they struggled to stop Watson and from what you saw in this game? Because he almost had 400 yards. They did hold hold Houston only 20 points, but still, he was tearing them apart pretty much uh, the entire game. Yeah, Like you were saying earlier, when he gets out of the pocket, it's terrible for our defense. So we just got to start containing him more 
because quarterbacks like that are going to beat us every single time. And it's going to get a guy wide open like Chad Hansen scored for them and just yeah. bad. <laughs> Yeah, like who is Chad Hansen, right? Like that's the type yeah, of guy. Like, squad. Right. And that's kind of what Andrew Luck did, right? It's like who is so and so? Who is uh I don't even know. I'm trying to think of some of those receivers, like but Marcus you know what Johnson. I mean. Yeah. Yeah, like who who are these guys, right? Who is Don Dontrell Inman outside of Indianapolis? Like that kind of stuff. Andrew Luck just makes the players around him better. Deshaun Watson does the same exact thing. So I think part of it was, yeah, the Colts struggled a little bit, the secondary. I definitely think that is a thing that was legit. They had that obviously miscommunication where it was just like a wide open touchdown, but you know, the defense also forced two turnovers in this game. I mentioned already the force Buckner force fumble. And how about that end of the game? That, that the way the game ended twice in a row now in these two games, fumble when Houston's driving Indianapolis recovers, they go on to win and uh, shout out Darius Leonard. Honestly, he, he led the team with 12 tackles, and he also had that forced fumble to end that game. And Kenny Moore, too, had not the greatest game, but you know, kind of what Grover Stewart did a couple weeks ago. Kenny Moore gets on that ball, hits it over to the other players to make sure his teammates can go have a chance at that ball. I thought that was just a great heads-up play by Kenny as well. Really loved what I saw from him there. But yeah, Darius Leonard, man. You know, the maniac. We haven't called his name, I feel like, a lot in terms of turnovers. It's been kind of a weird year to see that. Darius Leonard, he's just so known for that, to see him not, like, committing turnovers the way that he were used to him doing. It was just a little bit strange. But fortunately, he reminded us a little bit why he has that name. Really loved what I saw from, from Darius Leonard. Man, talk to me about Darius Leonard's season so far. What have you seen from him throughout this year? Yeah, Darius Leonard is really stepping up when it matters, like at the end of games and like he's getting clutch punch outs and he knows when to tackle to punch out at the same time, which you noticed tonight on yep. Kuti. So he comes up big when we need him. He does. He really does. And it's like key players have to make key plays. And we we saw that happen. Now the Colts have had diff- different players. Some of the players we consider like superstars on their defense have come up and made plays. Obviously Buckner had Buckner did obviously Leonard. We just talked about a couple of weeks last week. Kenny Moore did. So like, it's so great to see your key players making those big plays, but uh, do you have any concern with this defense moving forward? Cause you're playing Pittsburgh who doesn't have the greatest offense in the world, but nonetheless, they're number two seed right now. So there's still a good football team. And then you got Jacksonville who obviously still has won one game. And that game was against us. Of course, do you have any concerns about this defense moving forward or maybe the lack of offense? Anything about this team that concerns you heading into the playoffs? Secondary. We just got to get a like firm second cornerback because if Rocky's in, people are bashing him, but he's still like progressing. Right. But he also like gets too aggressive, starts holding, and bad penalties just kills in the end. And the offense, right. we just got to start running more. And that's just keep running it. It opens yeah. up more. Yeah, I guess the last thing that we can kind of talk about, Rigo Sanchez came back after a couple of weeks removed mm-hmm. from finding that cancerous tumor, got surgery on it. He came back, and uh, I thought he played really well. I really did. Even if he had the worst game of his life, to come back from that, incredible, incredible story, unbelievable that he he was able to do that. So shout out to Rigo. We're so glad to have you back, man. Hopefully uh, everything continues to be well for you. So thankful, man, that he's able to come back and play the game that he loves. So uh, that's also great. Yeah, just kind of looking at some of the stats, it actually was interesting because the the Texans really outgained the Colts on offense. They 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 led the time of possession. It was pretty even. The Texans led by about a minute more or so, but really overall, except for the rushing yards, Houston kind of really had an offensive. I don't want to say explosion, but kind of did. I mean, we thought the Colts offense looked good, that the Texans offense looked good as well. But the key thing for me here is this Colts, the Colts team comes in, they're number two in the league in terms of turnover differential, right? They're, they're plus 10. They come in today, they turn it over zero times, and they force two turnovers. That is going to win you football games right there when you're able to take care of the ball and take the ball away. For all the crap we gave the defense, they had two turnovers today. And I thought that was definitely big, really, really big in this matchup. Key turnovers and key moments. And so for all the crap we can give the defense for this week, and rightfully deserved in some ways, what can you say? They, they, they're just one of those teams that just is so predicated on the big turnover, the big play. And uh, I just loved what I saw um, in, in terms of that department, as, at least. 
So is there anything else, Zach, that you had that you noticed from this game we didn't mention? There's probably some stuff that as uh, I was processing, I didn't quite mention or didn't get around to. We talked about a lot in, you know, our post game stream and whatnot, but anything else that we didn't mention that you, you kind of noticed in this game? Yeah. Um, TY is also being a Houston kill. Like he always has like yeah. in 19 years versus Houston, he has 102 receptions for 11 touchdowns and 1800 yards. So wow. He's basically <laughs> a killer against them. Dang man. And this is also our best start since 2014. Yeah. 10 wins. I, I forgot to mention that the Colts sit at 10 wins now. I think what, what year is a couple of years ago? Were they, were they ten and six? I'm trying to remember uh, when the Colts went to the playoffs. Oh, they were either ten and six or eleven and five. I want to say they were ten and six. Uh, so the Colts have eclipsed yeah. that mark already, which is definitely huge. But it's crazy in this playoff. Looking at it, honestly, ten wins might not get you into the playoffs at this point with how good this ASC is right now. So the Colts have to just continue to do what they do. They have to win. Tennessee obviously won today, so they still retain the lead in the division, but. Next week, Tennessee's playing the best team in the NFC in Green Bay. So I really think there's a chance that they could lose that game. And if the Colts somehow come out and upset the Steelers, hey, then you're looking at potentially going from number six to maybe number four. That's crazy to me that that could potentially even be an option. But hey, uh, the NFL, anything can happen. Anything can happen in week to week. This wasn't the most pretty game, in my opinion, especially from the defensive side. But hey, a win's a win. I will definitely take it. All day long, I will take 10 wins, no matter how ugly they are <laughs> at certain points. I will take 10 wins all day long. You still have two more games to go. The ceiling is 12 and four. You realistically, excuse me, could go 12 and four. If you were able to upset Pittsburgh and then beat Jacksonville, Jacksonville's a one win team. So I think you have a good chance at beating them, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really think you have a good chance at uh, kind of run the table here. I, I yeah. really do. And being a really, really dangerous playoff team. Because you mentioned that you can run, they can run the ball, they can pass the ball, they can play defense, they can do everything. This team could go toe to toe with. I'm I'm convinced they can go toe to toe with any team in the AFC. Like I'm not going to say they're going to win, maybe every game, but I'm convinced they could go toe to toe with just about every single team, and that is so so huge. A couple years removed from losing a star quarterback, Chris Ballard has put together an incredible team, and uh, I sh- shout out to Philip Rivers, man. A lot of people doubted that signing. A lot of people hated that signing. And Philip Rivers has quietly silenced a lot of those doubters, including myself a little bit. I was, I didn't, I was kind of indifferent about the signing a little bit. But honestly, the more and more I've seen him continue to get better and command this offense, it's so clearly obvious to me that this he's such a massive upgrade at quarterback from what we had a year ago. And that's not a shot at Jacoby Brissett. It's just Philip Rivers is just that kind of player, future Hall of Famer for a reason. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, I guess, so the outlook in this, in the AFC, I already mentioned, you could potentially go up to the number four seed. So really this Pittsburgh game is a huge, huge, huge game. And we'll get into this a little bit later, but how confident are you that the Colts team could potentially beat this Pittsburgh team? We could de- I think we could definitely beat Pittsburgh. It's no doubt in my mind that we're going to win next week. Think so? Yeah, we're on a hot roll right now. We're just going to keep going. We're just going to keep going 1-0 to the end of the season. Yeah, that would be amazing. The playoffs. Yeah, Colts win 27-20. Wasn't the most pretty game, but hey, good teams find ways to win no matter if it's pretty, no matter if it's ugly. So, uh, Zach, thanks so much, man, for coming on and kind of talking about this game, recapping it a little bit. I guess before we go, just tell everybody where they can find you on social media, YouTube, all that stuff. Uh, I'm Heinz underscore BTJ on Instagram and Heinz underscore 21 on YouTube. So go check me out and check out my content. Appreciate you guys. Thanks for having me on the show, too. Appreciate it. Absolutely. And thank you guys for listening. (laughs) Great victory. Kind of an ugly one. Not what we expected, but hey, a win, win is a win. We'll take it. Ten wins. I love it. All right. So for Zach and myself, thanks guys so much. And as always, go Colts.